It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I um, also want to thank Bam and uh, Overtone and Z33 um, for for having me here as well. Um, it's it's really exciting to to just hear these two fellows speak. They're they're both uh, individuals that I've been aware of over the years. Um, Carlo as well. I've kind of followed their programming online, coming from New York, and uh, so it's quite nice to, to hear them talk, and to meet you guys. Hey, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, hi, I'm Justin Luke from Audiovisual Arts, um, located in New York. Um, what's up with Audiovisual Arts? Um, it's a space that I opened in 2008 in New York City in the East Village. Um, I come from a background of graphic design and I was working as a designer in New York um, since 2000 and around 2008 I decided that I didn't want to do design anymore and I wanted to shift into a different field and um, having a background with music as well and a recording studio that was in this building in the East Village. Um, it was a recording studio that my brother and I, well we still have it, it's in the basement of the building where the gallery is now. And um, we'd had that space for some years and then the storefront above the studio came available and uh, I had like a, a week to decide on whether or not to take it so I took it and then uh, had to figure out what to do with it and decided to open a gallery. Um, kind of surveyed the landscape of the New York art world and uh, was looking for what was missing or what I wanted to see that wasn't there. And uh, Diapason, which is a space that m many of you might be familiar with, was still going on at that time. That was the only space in New York that was focusing on sound and doing a fantastic job of it. Um, but I saw that there could be even more to explore with that idea and uh, saw the potential in that. And having a love for sound and music decided to open up um, audio visual arts. That's the little logo there. And uh, this is what we're talking about. Um, so this is New York City here. Um, many of you have probably seen this map before. Um, the gallery is located in this location right here, downtown New York. When I opened it in 2008, there was a little activity um, in the Lower East Side of galleries opening up. and since 2008, it's grown tremendously. Um, this is what it looks like now. That's the Lower East Side. All those red dots are galleries, and that's no exaggeration. It's uh, you Google Maps Art Gallery. That's what you get, and you go down there, and it's just like insane. Um, so, Audiovisual Arts is located here, and uh, it's kind of nice being in that location because it's just north of the, the concentration of most of the smaller galleries down there. So I'm a little off the beaten path, and it's on a nice kind of quiet block. Um, this is a, a shot from the outside of the gallery at night. That blue lit room is, is audiovisual arts. It's a very small space. Um, that's a show by an artist named Ruben Lorch Miller, who uh, did a show there in 2008. Here's a day shot of the gallery out front. Um, that's uh, a piece by Rolf Ulis, who um, we've heard a, a lot about today for a good reason. He's an amazing artist, and um, that was a piece I presented in 2010. So uh, what are your ideas about curating and running a gallery space? Um, I like the idea of having a very focused dynamic within the room. Um, I'm interested in contributing something to the landscape of, of New York in terms of an art gallery. and. Um, I like the idea of a, a space that develops continually with the time, addressing the past but also kind of moving forward. I'm interested in the development of artists and seeing how they kind of grow. And I'm interested in it as a, an educational platform for myself um, so I can kind of look uh, into that realm, the territory of sound, music, and art and kind of learn more. I don't have a background um, studying art. I, I didn't work at a gallery or any institution like that, so this has kind of been my uh, education. Um, how do you survive? 
um, design and sales. Um, it's a self-funded gallery. It's, it's just me. Um, unfortunately, funding in the U.S. in terms of the arts isn't as uh, um, supportive as it is, I, I imagine, in Europe. But that's fine. And, and I have a, a background doing design. Um, so it's a skill set that can enable me to earn a certain amount of money. So occasionally I'll do um, some freelance design projects to, to fund this space. Um, and I'll sell work as well. It's a for-profit gallery. Um, and I've always int been interested in it kind of remaining as a, a for-profit space. Um, and, and the potential of enabling artists that work with this territory if it's possible. And it, and it has worked a little bit, but it's still, it's still got a little ways to go. Um, you feature different disciplines. Do you have specific motives on this choice? Um, yes, uh, yes, I do. Um, I'm interested in the development of, uh, of the sound art realm. And uh, what was interesting about Diapason, Michael J. Schumacher's space, is that it had a, it had a very strong focus and it, a very specific community around it. Um, the challenge of something like that, though, is that it, it, was, it seemed to kind of fall into a loop of itself. And, and this is something I'd even spoken with, with Michael about. And so thinking about um, a way to get more people from the visual arts into the gallery to have more of a cross-section between uh, the audio and the visual, um, perhaps uh, it becomes like a bait-and-hook kind of situation where um, while I'm interested primarily in sound-related work, I'll have an occasional show that will bring in like a very strong kind of visual crew, you know, like, and, and oftentimes of a younger artist or, or um, an even more established visual artist that might not have anything to do with sound, but doing a show with them, suddenly you have this whole other crew coming in and you have a nice overlap of the pre-existing audience from the sound world and there's a nice kind of mashup there. I'm interested in, in the unknown, things that I kind of have a hard time understanding or, or, or pinpointing. Um, I like work in, in terms of sound that um, is rooted in ideas, um, something that goes beyond just what you're hearing or what you're seeing. Um, I'm interested in work that's classic or feels timeless, but also like has like a sense of movement and like progression in it. Um, I have a, a, a particular connection and and uh, affinity for sound and music, I'd say it's the medium that I respond to the most and that has the most depth for me. Um, how do you find your artists and decide on who is exhibited? Uh, FaceTime, you know, not the, uh, not the Apple, iPad, iPhone kind of FaceTime, but speaking with an artist face-to-face, -face, meeting in person um, is important to me. So for that reason, most of the shows at the gallery have been local artists in New York or maybe on the outskirts of the East Coast. Um, I like for the artists to be able to kind of come to the space, spend time there, be able to meet, have a conversation, and, and kind of develop a bit of a relationship rather than just kind of phoning in the work or having it just land and install. Um, I'm interested in working with younger artists, work that they're kind of developing in that moment. Perhaps they're even in school and they're still kind of putting together a project and we'll just do an exhibition of that. Um, I'm also interested in kind of older, more established artists or lesser known artists, but I, I'd like to have a range of work at the space, um, an international platform, and once again, un under-recognized artists. How do you broaden the subject of sound art in relation to visual arts? Um, so I'll take you guys through some slides of some of the, the exhibitions that have been at the gallery over the years and talk about some and then just kind of blaze through. This is uh, the first piece that was exhibited at Audiovisual Arts. Um, it was really the only piece that was there. It's a work by an artist named John Andrew and uh, it's basically a desktop fan with a harmonica mounted on it. And so when you plug it in, you turn it on, it kind of creates this wavering drone that kind of fluctuates with the electricity. And it's just a very simple, kind of beautiful sculptural work that um, has a very kind of subtle but powerful sonic quality to it. That piece is called Domestic Drone. This is a, a pure visual show that I did with a young artist named Jason Loebs. 
um, where he'd taken this scanner and drowned it and then was kind of doing these these photocopies of air and made these like these different prints also has a sculptural piece there another just pure visual show and and really the only only had in the, in the six years I've been open I've only had two painting shows um, not so interested in painting I mean I love painting but for this particular project um, paintings are rarity but these are, are works by John Fahey who is a deceased um, musician well-known kind of neoclassical guitarist many of you might know who he is and he made incredible paintings in the 90s this is uh, an exhibition also by John Andrew who made that sculpture before where he uh, was transmitting sounds of the sun, um, recordings he'd, he'd acquired from NASA, where he kind of created a, a room that was just fully immersive and, and really kind of focusing on sub-frequencies. That's another shot of it. This was uh, another just pure visual show by an artist named Morgan Tishumber. Um, she's a French artist and just kind of created this fractured landscape within the space. It was really, uh, really bizarre, but beautiful. This is uh, an installation by Michael J. Schumacher, um, founder of Diapason, who is, is a fantastic artist and most recently has been focusing more on his music, um, but created a, a really beautiful kind of space and a composition for this space that really is kind of playing off of the room and rich with texture, sonic texture, and really, really beautiful show. Um, this was an exhibition with Akio Suzuki, who uh, once again is, is a, a friend of many of ours, and a beautiful exhibition, kind of like a mini survey of sorts of his work, um, featuring his sculptures and, and a lot of the, uh, the pieces that are, are for kind of imagining their sounds. And, and a number of his in, in, instruments as well. Um, I have a nice video of, of him performing a lot of these works, but I don't know if there'll be time for that. This is an installation by an artist named Sergi Cherepinen, who created uh, a, a space kind of playing off the idea of difference tones. Sergi had um, studied with Marianne Amache and um, is kind of in some ways continuing some of her, her ideas and developing upon them. Another installation by Sergi where he kind of created these other sound sculptures that could be played by the visitors and um, where you could actually kind of shape the sound with the material. He also had a piece in that that was kind of dealing with difference tones or ear tones. Um, an installation by an artist named Antoine Catala where he kind of faced these two flat screen televisions, mirrored them, just playing normal everyday television throughout the day and it would, would be anything from the news to a baseball game or, or something. He had this like silver tube that was connecting them almost seamlessly such that it looked like this strange kind of sci-fi futuristic weird mashup of technology. This is from the inside. Um, the gallery has a, a little silver box that you can see here um, out in front and it's a, it's a box where um, I'll present different works, audio works. I mean, it can be anything, kind of sound related. Um, there are four outputs for headphones, so people can pass by at any hour throughout the day and just kind of tap into it, you know, when they're en route to whatever. And sometimes it'll be, a, you know, a series of works organized by an artist that is specific to the location or something that they can kind of spend some time with. Sometimes it's just jokes, you know, like. Um, but this particular piece is with Lawrence Abu Hamdan, who's a really interesting British artist who kind of set up a, a series of um, audio files that explore the idea of uh, the forensics of listening and um, ideas of listening in relation to law and uh, put together a really beautiful series of recordings on that. I can give you more information. We could also talk about that for hours. Um, this is an installation by Sabisha Friedberg, who's a young uh, New York-based artist, and she kind of created this, uh, this sculpture, this kind of custom subwoofer that was um, playing strictly with the physicality of sound, except in, in relation to sonic levitation, where she kind of uh, created this weird box that would hover these little kind of 
uh, sheets of paper with these little graphics on them, and they would just kind of be like floating in the space um, by way of, of the subsonics. Um, this is a show from uh, just about a month ago with uh, Seth Cluett, who has uh, a, a really interesting practice as an artist, but also like a very extensive um, sound art archive um, worth kind of visiting and getting to know sometime if you're in New York. So that's the uh, audio visual arts sampler and uh, appreciate y'all listening. <laughs> 